local foods by vendors. Before we begin, I would like to share a few housekeeping items as usual. Today's webinar is scheduled to last approximately an hour and a half to two hours at most. During the session, the audience can submit questions via the Q&A chat box directly to the speaker. You may be invited on video to ask your questions and the video is being recorded. You may receive a survey also after the webinar. Please make sure to provide your feedback. And with that, I would like to introduce our chairman and board of the board, uh, engineer Abdullah Booker, to uh, make his opening uh, and welcoming remarks. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I welcome you again, one more event on the PEF virtual talk program. And this time, we are also addressing key issues that affect all of us, um, not only as professionals, but as also members of families that survive. We have today a very interesting topic to be dealt with by an expert who you would hear when he's introduced all the credentials that he has. And I like to remind people that those who attended our first event so remember, we actually started on this similar topic on HSE in the workplace to make sure we protect the person. Then we proceeded to do things that will ensure that the person, the qualities and the expertise with which to develop himself. And then we moved back again into addressing what you should do in the workplace. And now we are addressing what you should do at home. We should all remember also how we address all these topics in a, in, a, in a structured manner. We should remember that virtually every one of us eats some form of processed food every day. And it is so rampant and so much in the subliminal that we actually don't understand and address it. I'm very happy to say today that our foundation, PEF, is bringing this topic to the front and having an expert to discuss it and try to unravel and show people what is going on and what should be done about it. So please give him our best attention and we'll welcome constructive questions as well as a question and answer session that will allow us increase whatever level of knowledge we have on it and will also show ways that we can make the best use of what we have learned here. So I would like to thank all of you for joining. I'd like to thank all the people who are coming in, the BOT members, Ahmed, who's got the responsibility to make this work, as well as the speakers and the Honorable Secretary for all they have done and our support functions. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much and I wish us a successful event. So over to you, Ahmed. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, once again, I would like to welcome everyone, um, in addition to all of what our, our, our chairman has just mentioned. Um, today's topic, uh, the topic of food safety and hygiene is of critical importance. Learning to recognize and being aware of the dangerous, unsafe handling and poor processing of staple food by vendors can save your life and those close to you. According to the first comprehensive report on food safety from the World Health Organization, Unsafe food is responsible for 600 million cases of foodborne diseases and 420,000 deaths globally each year. Toxic chemicals are being used by food sellers across Sub-Saharan Africa to improve the look, feel, and taste of many of our staple food items. Vendors cover fruits and vegetables with chemical products that accelerate the ripening process and make produce appear to be healthier than they are naturally. These are just some of the dangers we face when buying staple foods today. Joining us is engineer Harriman Oyofo, who is a subject matter expert. Engineer Oyofo is the CEO of Man Associates Limited, a leading HSC and loss control management firm. He is also an internationally accredited technical safety auditor and major accident investigator, loss control and HSC program consultant, public safety speaker, 
and a certified emergency preparedness and response management program advisor. Now remember, whether you shop at a supermarket, local market, or direct from vendors from any, for any consumable, today's PEEF virtual talk is for you to pay close attention to. With that, I would like to please welcome our guest speaker for today, Engineer Oyofo. Thank you for joining us, and we are excited about your presentation today. Yeah. Thank you, Ahmed. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Executive Secretary, and our supporting then participants. I think you've capped it all for me. The job is very easy now, since all the key points you have readily uh, pushed them forward. But if we should look at what we are talking about today, there's cause to be very wary of what's going on in food processing and handling by vendors and even farmers who originally grow these foods. The first part is for it to get to the market, they would have been handled by the farmers themselves, preserved, stored before for pushing them to the vendors. And the vendors have processes to turn them to food from raw material. That is the interface where the problem is mostly seen, where people add chemicals of all sorts and descriptions and uh, potency to what they sell. So that's what we are going to discuss. It's not something new. It's been with us, but we just need to grow the awareness. So, Ahmed, thank you. And uh... um, excellent, thank you. I'll begin running your, your, your PowerPoint slides so that you can uh, begin your delivery of this very important and great message. Okay, this this first slide is okay. We can think we can move on. And this is just me and my my last born in the background hanging on the wall is a photo we took on Saturday, so we can skip this because the introduction is being made. Now, this is like the roadmap. We look at the facts surrounding this practice and uh, look around Africa mm -hmm. and mention some of the chemicals and what they are used for and how to avoid the implications. So, Ahmed, please, next one. Well, the purpose is to drive awareness how people use these additives and preservatives. And the use is quite widespread. And we think the best part and the first step to take is to drive awareness, let people be aware. Let us talk to each other about it and ensure that wherever you are, you don't lose sight of the possibility of contamination of what you are buying and how to look out for it if possible. Next, please. The, the WHO put out their first report and uh, the it's not very pleasing to the eye or the mind. There are up to, these practices cause up to 200 diseases known, ranging from uh, common diarrhea to cancers. And about 600 million people, one in 10 people in the world, they fall ill. And 20,000 die every year. And if you want to calculate it in terms of the Life, years, people, that's 33 million years. That means if you add up all the ages of the people who die and the expected life expectancy, you will get 33 million healthy life years snuffed out. All because they bought something to eat or drink. So it's, it is quite a serious issue. Yes, please, let's move to the next one. And as always, children, on the five, they bear the brunt, which is 40% about, and that is the 125,000 deaths every year, children. Diarrheal diseases are most common illnesses 
And as we said before, 550 million people fall in 230,000 deaths by year as a result. And if you have a large population and you are most exposed, you probably suffer more. And uh, food safety is linked to all sorts. In fact, the wife, the life we live, unsafe food creates a vicious circle of disease, malnutrition, suffering, pain for everyone, ranging from the youngest infants to the oldest people, old and infant. So it's quite an envelope of a problem. And it strains healthcare systems, economic systems, government budgets, private budgets, or individual budgets, corporate budgets. So it's really a problem that it's home to every one of us, whether we know it or we don't know it. Next, please. Food supply chains now cross multiple borders. You know, what's it produced in Nigeria may find its way to India or Iraq or US, I know it does, and UK, Europe generally. So if you have collaboration between governments and producers, it may go through easily. But because of mishandling, the problem is people in the middle income group of countries, they lose at least up to 100 billion a year in medical expenses and curative uh, uh, treatment. If you want to take an example like in Nigeria, farmers lose up to 30% of their habit due to using these chemicals and uh, they use them. So when they prepare to send them to the market, a few days they will decay because of the effect of the chemical. And uh, we are not going to talk about the, the issue of Nigerian food produce, whether process or semi process, not being able, <clears throat> excuse me, to find that not acceptable in global marketplaces because they believe, quite rightly so to some extent, that the process of producing them cannot be audited because there's evidence, clear evidence of people adulterating their products. Local products are adulterated with all kinds of chemicals. So we get to that. So we suffer economically as a people, individuals and the nation. Taxation will be low if production is destroyed. The government cannot begin to tax what is destroyed. So it's incumbent on all of us to talk about these issues. And as I said, it's the awareness of the problem that we form the basis of moving forward to look for other solutions. Next, please. <clears throat> Excuse me. And we, if you take it back to where it started from, you have a prevalence of uh, cancer, kidney damage, heart attack, all sorts of chronic diseases now are commonplace in Nigeria and other places in sub-Saharan Africa. And I understand that it's the same thing too, from what I gather in places like India, who are somewhat similar to the way we do things. And uh, these same uh, issues are popping up because of or traceable to the practices of people using uncontrolled use of drugs and chemicals in foods, that is fruits, vegetables, meat, and fish. For whatever reason, like I mentioned, it may be for aesthetic, for good look, for it to look fresh, for the volume to increase, for the person who is buying to say, wow, this is the best uh, banana bunch I've seen so far. Let me grab some for myself. So it's a problem, which unfortunately we have to dig in our wallet to raise the money, pay for it, and go on to eat it, not knowing that you are ingesting poisonous stuff. So it's something we should pay attention to. Next please.
most uh, worrying of the lot, if you want to cite Nigeria as an example, is our commodity, uh, uh, we, our produce are rejected in commodity market very easily. Like I said before, there is no auditing, no trace. You can't draw a line from beginning to the end when the product comes to the market or before it makes its way to your table. So, for example, in the year 2016 to 17, the EU banned 67 processed food products from Nigeria in their commodity market. These include the commonest things like brown and white beans, melons, palm oil, mushrooms, shellfish, smoked fish, all sorts of things, shell granules, and so on. So it's quite a problem. It's not an individual problem. You know. It's a common problem that affects us. Because if a guy is a farmer and he can't sell, there's no money for him to do anything. So basically, this map shows Sub-Saharan Africa from uh, the tip of Mauritania to South Africa, including Madagascar, where the report indicates that these practices are very common and they are everyday things. So it's a huge problem. It may be taking place in uh, Maghreb region of Africa and the Asian countries, but apart from India, like I said before, we are not too uh, close to what's happening there in terms of information. But I'm sure if we had the time to dig through and spoke to people, it might well be that the practice is the way. So for those of us who are not from Sub-Saharan Africa, and that is Asia, America, or Europe, I think we need to seek information as to what we are buying from the market, or if indeed these similar practices exist. So that's what we think one of the takeaways from here should be after this event. Now, just to mention a few of these, calcium carbide chloride is, is used in fruits and vegetables and in cooked foods. Like if you are a Nigerian, you, you go to the Uka to eat. You find uh, people love pepper soup, whether fish or meat. You may well find that some of these chemicals have been used to enhance the taste, the look, the quantity, and the quality, which people think is more qualitative. But in actual fact, due to the rapid decay, you'll find that there's no quality there at all. Formalin, which is a chemical used for embalming dead bodies, is used to enhance the look of meat and fish, and also to keep out flies. Then another uh, insect from things like uh, the common street soya or fish and to keep them fresh and so on. But to show you how deep it is, the common house, household cleaning agent, bleach, the common one women buy from the market or, or whoever who needs it buys from the market, is used to enhance the production. That is the fermentation of cassava, the processing of cassava to become gari or fufu, and uh, all sorts of other things they use it for. So it's really, a problem that I think we can only solve with education because the people spoken to who are engaged in these practices were quite clear that the practice is necessary for them to get more yield per ton of what they are selling. So it's, it is a mind thing. So we need to get to heart and mind to clear this up or at least make a dent on it as we go along. Please. Next place, Amen. While I'm waiting on Ahmed to- Go ahead, go one. ahead, uh, engineer, you're on the next slide. Okay, all right. The calcium potash 
what we locally call account, and I'm not sure what is called elsewhere, is used as softening agent. And we use it in cooking beans, softening uh, grains like uh, corn, when you want to produce massa, and uh, it's used in Nigerian delicacies of Nkobia and Ishewu indiscriminately. But the one that really worries me is what they use to preserve beans, to keep out weevils. It's called, uh, it's aluminum phosphate. It's called uh, on the street, striker. Because once you spray the beans, the bag of beans with it, it doesn't, no weevil will be there and uh, you think it's all okay. If you buy a bag of beans and you take it home for consumption, after two, three weeks, if you dig right in, you find that they molded together and they are all now black and gooey. But before you get to that point, you would have cooked some of them and eaten it, especially some of us during Ramadan period when we eat akara all the time. So all these things come into play. And uh, all other kinds of pesticides you use around the house to kill rodents and stuff like that. They are used as bulk repellents in foods and fruits. And uh, some used to soak meat before you boil them. Then at the end, you end up cooking or boiling the meat like uh, cow tail. You want it to get soft or cow leg very fast. So you cook it in a paracetamol or codeine so that you spend lesser time over the stove or cooker. And it looks all nice, fresh, and, you know, good looking to the eye, pleasing to the eye. So these things, they continue to occur every day. So that's, this slide you're looking at is uh, some of the uh, things they do with meats, fruits, and vegetables. The, the one on the far right is actually a picture I lifted up from the, one, the middle one and the far right. There are pictures of reports I, from India, which I lifted. But I've seen, we've seen the same thing in Nigeria. So it's not just from elsewhere, but uh, it's not just Nigeria or Africa. You can find it everywhere else if you look closely in practices in Asia and Africa. On your left is meat being cooked in paracetamol and uh, the NAFDAC people, that's the Nigerian Food and Drug Administration people who went on inspection. They actually caught these people red-handed and uh, they photographed it with the police uh, uh, park tablets alongside the port to emphasize the point. In the middle is a guy who is preparing uh, fufu. Fufu is common food in this part, in West Africa mostly. And uh, they are using chemicals they normally use to, you know, highlight the quality, the whitening, the look, the aesthetics, and so on, which is bleach. They use a lot of bleach on that. And the guy on the right is doing the same cooking again with uh, uh, paracetamol and codeine. So, and these these three pictures are from Nigeria. The other ones were from India. So, just to make a point, it's not saying that's the only place where it can be. But these are reports put out by Nigerian Foods and Drug Administration. So, it's a live thing. We have to watch out. Okay, at this point, in agreement with our director, we like to break for space for people to share their experience if there's any, or if there's somebody who is interested. So, how many, how many minutes will this be? Sure, no, just a few minutes. And I'm sure, you know, I thank you so much for sharing a lot of this really great content and uh, engineer. 
I would never look at uh, another pepper soup the same again uh, when I go out to eat uh, in, in restaurants. And I'm sure many of our attendees here today perhaps maybe have some of their own experiences or maybe some knowledge that they've had with these types of uh, uh, situations. So we were hoping that we can engage our audience uh, to share some of their stories or maybe even to give examples of things that we, we are not uh, necessarily familiar with because this is always a very creative space for, for vendors, uh, folks who do whatever it takes to get their products uh, uh, from farm to table. Uh, so I'm would love our thinking about this. Engineer, I was curious, um, you know, I read somewhere, you know, which is an interesting thing because it never occurred to me that uh, plantain, usually when I see people walk around selling plantain, uh, when I'm driving by sometimes, I see people holding a batch of plantain and all of them are all ripe um, all together. And I discovered uh, in doing some of my initial research that plantain does not ripe all together all at once. So apparently it's a very sus it's very suspect to see a whole batch of plantain um, ripe all together. Uh, so it made me curious to look back and say, oh my goodness. So many times, many of these plantains that we see ripe all at once being sold usually on the streets or in the markets, they have been, uh, they have been tampered with. Are there all other right. examples of sorry, things like sorry. that? Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, no, I was just wondering, are there other types of examples of, uh, of those types of uh, things that folks should look out for? It's the same thing with uh, bananas. Bananas don't get ripe. And from, for those of us from agrarian communities, we know that if we can tell you that bananas, there is a way to determine whether they are now uh, matured enough to be cut from the tree. When the the uh, the little uh, you, you might call it flower, but it's a little soft of uh, growth at the end of the banana itself. Same with the plantain. When it's dried up, becomes gray, and you can just pick it off with your hand. You know that banana is ripe. Mm. It's uh, ripe enough to pluck to cut off the tree. Then when you take it home, the first, uh, the, those nearest to the stem, the stem of the bunch, the upper, bun upper uh, bunches of banana, they start getting ripe first, all the way till it gets to the tip. So it's only a question of days. If you keep it in the house for one, two, three days, it will be ripe all over. But the same treatment they give to bananas is what they give to plantain. And the plantain is the same thing, the way to determine that is, is uh, matured enough to be cut off the tree is when you touch the tip, the little growth there, you can break it off with your hand. It's gray and it goes up, it's dried up and you just flick it off with your finger. You know, ah, this plantain is matured enough to be cut off the tree. And again, there's another indicator, only farmers will know this, those who have been to the farms is sometimes when they are matured enough, just before they get to ripening, the upper bunches will start bursting. You know, you will you see them split open by themselves because of the pressure of maturity. So those are the ones you cut down quickly from the tree. And in two, three days, they'll be ripe. But if you want to solve the problem, like, Personally, if you want to buy plantains, please, if it's possible for you to buy a bunch from people who display it on the roadside, just coming from the farm, take it to your house. It will get ripe in its own time and you can use it. Otherwise, if they take it home, chances are that they will douse it in carbide and cover it in uh, some material to generate the necessary heat for it to get ripe before time. Mm -hmm. And if it's ripened forcefully, in two, three days, it will start decaying, going immediately soft. This is what happens to tomatoes, to peppers, bell peppers, and the rest of them. They suddenly start going soft, shrinking. The same with watermelon, pineapples, all of them. So 
if you want to buy, buy from people coming from the farm or farm produce market, there are still some like that where you go in the evening or afternoon, they've just returned from the farm and you buy, you will see the stem still dripping water. So you show sure you are on to a good thing. And it's the same with you. If you want to eat pepper soup, better you learn how to cook it so that you know what you're eating. <laughs> I'm no, sure, it's true. I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. Now another 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 um another area of concern I think is something that people many of us uh, have access to and we do eat a lot of uh, things like fish and meat. Yeah. Now yeah. I understand you know there's also situations where many of these uh, fishermen rather than than actually uh, uh, put in the net into the uh, the rivers or wherever they fish from they pour chemicals into the area and the fish die and rise to the top. Um, and yes. they just wrap them up. So this is another very concerning uh, practice. That is true. They, they use gamalin 20. When they dam the stream or river, they, they put the chemicals in there. And once they do that, the fishes will start floating half dead, then they collect them. And the way we uh, we experience the way to check it, is talking to people who do these practices. If you want to buy fresh fish from anybody, please, if it's not still alive, or it's not still alive, open the gills. If it's reddish, you know it's a fresh fish. But if it's grayish or blackish, you know it was killed by a uh, or fish with chemical. So there are so many things you can do if you have the right knowledge, which mm -hmm. we can't possibly cover in this kind of discussion. But people need to begin to find out how to identify some of these things. And no. uh, they, they also use those chemicals when they are going to smoke the fish. They soak yes. it in the chemical before they put it over the fire. And uh, when you break the dry fish, it doesn't taste like fish. You know, dry fish is usually with yellowish flesh. And you chew a piece for a long, long time. You won't forget the taste. But this one, they are basically tasteless. And uh, I've come across people in the fish market. They, they call it Benue fish. I don't know. I say why. They can't explain to me why they call Benue fish. But not because it's all from Benway State or, or mm. Benway River. So there are so many things they are doing, which a little bit of further knowledge might help mm -hmm. to reduce the incidence or frequencies of intake yeah. of this chemical. Now, another, another really concerning uh, practice, which I particularly find very appalling and very disturbing, is the usage of these. Uh, the embalming uh, chemicals, the one that they put on dead bodies to keep them fresh. Uh, yeah. My understanding is, is this is used on many of our meat products uh, to keep things looking, something that may have gone bad or something that may necessarily go bad in a short period of time because of lack of refrigeration or other things. They inject them with these uh, embalming chemicals or rub them. Uh, many of the things that we eat, such as kilishi, suya, or any of this stuff, so that or fresh meat at the market, you know, mm -hmm. how does that? What what does that look like? How can one, how can one, um, at least make sure they do their due diligence when purchasing meat or what they think? There's, is so, there's only one simple uh, check. You uh, some simple something to look for if you are going to buy fresh meat. If you come to the meat store and, and not proper meat shop. You know, a normal open market. If you come to a meat store where you see there are no flies anywhere, don't buy from there. Because the genuine meat sellers, you see them with a, a fan, which they wave across the meat on display from time to time. But nowadays, when you go, you see the guy sitting there, there's not a single fly near his uh, table where he displayed the meat. Then you know that, ah, this one has been impregnated with uh, uh, 
uh, burning liquid formalin. And so if, case, if that case, meat came to the if the meat came to the market, say nine a.m. in the morning, in nine in the evening, it's still as fresh and red as ever. So you know that this is not it. Okay. So in this case, uh, flies are a good thing. If you see flies, yes, <laughs> of course you could, you could say that because they, are, they they don't want to die, so they keep clear. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to let you go back to the rest of your presentation. I know you've answered some really key questions here. Um, okay. Yeah, well, this the dangers to body organs, your lungs, your brains, your heart, your stomach. You hear of renal failure, skin with some hideous looking. Yeah, infections and so on in your liver. These are the sensitive organs. Of course, every organ in the body is sensitive. These are the organs, these chemicals combine to attack, either singly or together at any given time. And over time, you begin to hear of failures of this organ. That's why in our own country, there's so much medical tourism to go out, go shopping for organ replacement and so on. And generally, it keeps pressure on everything, economic pressure. Imagine families who have to look for money to send somebody abroad for liver treatment, lungs, or stomach cancer or the heart is racing in different directions and so on. So it is a common issue now, and it's a problem that is facing everybody, either singly or as a group of people. As far as we have learned, as far as we know, and we need to pay attention to what we eat now more than ever before. Next, please. So, you know, this forest of problems, what can we do about it? Well, the we there is for people, really, because uh, we are in a group and we are raising this issue to the public. And we are more or less powerless in a way, by way of what we can do in terms of regulation, laws, and penalties and so on. So I think the first bit left to us is to engage uh, governments and the special public like unions, market women leaders, all Nigeria farmers association, vendors, market masters, and so on. Talk to them about what's happening, what we know they are doing, what they know they are doing, what they actually can do to reduce the prevalence of this practice. We can also champion public enlightenment campaigns. By championing, I mean the same engagement, talking to people, going to sponsors, having them to fund campaigns. Then we can develop, we can help in developing jingles and uh, uh, clips for public education starting from kindergarten to the university and college levels. And I think the only way we can do this is to seek partnerships. And uh, I'm afraid to mention government because uh, it's not that government is bad, but uh, when you aim at government uh, collaboration in things in Nigeria, suddenly so many, uh, obstacles pop up, which will slow down progress, if any at all. But in other countries, it might be better. But I think, like us in PIF, these are some of the things we should do. And keep reminding people that these things are economically destructive to the country. They put pressure on everything. You have budget deficit here and there. These are the root causes of things like that. Because when you look at a guy who's 
uh, adulterating the ripening of banana, for instance, they say, ah, this is nothing to do with you. Of course, it has something to do with you because at the end of the day, the collective force is suffering. That's why it is serious. Next please, sir. Again, for us, really, our strongest weapon is to spread the word. Talk to everybody about it. We have people who are farmers, people, friends who are farmers, brothers, sisters who are married to farmers and so on. If we let them know, if we tell the consumers what to look for, we tell the farmers what to look for, what to desist from, we tell the people who are the vendor what they are doing wrong, what we think scientifically is not right, it might help. And uh, those are the things we should do because let's face it, we are all equally exposed. Nobody is, is outside the ring of exposure here. And uh, if we don't take it up to spread the word and raise awareness, we may not get any uh, any much of a feedback of people changing for the good. Because daily, we sign on to voluntary poisoning. It's, it's uh, creeping. You pay for it. It's funny. You pay for it. You negotiate the price and you pay and you take home the food item. But you're not thinking that this food item is going to hurt you. You don't know. It doesn't even occur to you. It's the natural thing to go out to the shop, shop for groceries, buy something you want to eat. And it's all encompassing from great cradle to grave. No exemption, we are all in it. Whatever you are in society, you are exposed. And being people from the tropics, we love fruits and vegetables. And they are often very much close to hand. If you can get them off the farm, okay. Then you are cutting off the vendor part. So you just need, you take the little that the farmer adulterated it. In. But that's still a plus for you because when it gets to the market, it acquires more adulteration, more penetration of the poison. And these malpractices, they hurt all of us in the environment. We are not going to escape it. If we escape the economic impact, we may not escape the health impact and the safety impact and so on. So let's spread the word, that's the message. If we can do that, then we should say something is coming up and people will begin to take a second look at what they do for whatever reason they do it. Next please. Well, uh, Ahmed, I think this, we are back to you. Yes, you know, this, is, this is all really great information here that you've shared with us, uh, Engineer. I do actually have a question from one of our yeah. audience members. Um, and the question is, uh, did, uh, you gave uh, an example or you made a statement earlier about the EU and the rejection of uh, the 67 food items that, uh, that, uh, that we export. Did, did the EU yes. give any specific reasons for rejecting these items? Yes, the main reason was, like I said, they cannot vouch for the auditing of the process that produced those items in terms of handling, in terms of chemicals, because all process and semi-processed uh, foods from Nigeria or products that year, 2016 to 2017, they were not admissible in EU market. Even pepper, I mean red pepper, they, they, were, they say when you harvest pepper, how you process them to become dry. Some people say use chemicals to make them dry fast. So that's the reason. The main reason they gave was adulteration in handling and processing. Now, as, as a follow-up question uh, from the same person to, to that, uh, seeing that this is an export issue, did the, are you aware of anything our Export Promotion Council have done positive to, reserve, to, 
to reverse or to address this uh, this issue? Because uh, certainly this is a showstopper uh, for yeah, our export for our exporting business. Yeah. Um, as for promotion people, I have to be honest, I didn't get to talk to them, but I talked with NAPDAC people and the port agents. And what they said to me was they are talking to them. They are talking to the exporter to be sure that the products they bring are not contaminated in any way through chemical abuses and so on. But mm. you can make what you like of that answer. But I believe if the government, oh, okay, here we go again. If the, if NAFDAQ that is busy going around trying to educate people is unsuccessful in passing the message, it's going to be difficult to, to see us making any headway in this direction. Why is it difficult for NAFDAQ? They go out maybe in ones and twos, and you know our people, you know, short while they start getting struck, you say, look, just push off. I got something to do here. And oh, you, you know, it becomes an altercation and they too, they are, they are afraid for, to go too far with individuals. So that's why I believe if there's a message, constant beat of messages coming from government, federal level, sponsored on TV, radio, social gatherings, in posters, in handbills, and so on. Over time, people will, will begin to take a second look. Like I said to you the other day, I make example of uh, uh, car seat belts. Even our chairman can testify to this. When we started that campaign in the 80s in Port Harcourt and Worry, we were together, me and the chairman, and I was the front driver of that campaign. Sometimes you go to people to talk to them about it. They ridicule you and they chase you away. But in no time, through persistence and endless campaign, they started buying into it. The government never got up one day and said, you use seatbelt. It was the infectious campaign of Shell that gradually changed the attitude. And uh, today is the first thing you touch when you enter a car. Mm -hmm. In our country, for instance, I, don't, I won't speak for other countries, but I know I've been to Ghana and other West African countries and Southern African countries, apart from Zimbabwe and South Africa, I hesitate to say that seatbelt is automatic. The use is automatic to the, to the car occupants. So we have to do the same. If, we, if somebody stands and say, look, let's recognize this as an evil practice. Let's get rid of it. It's harmful to safety, to your health, to the economy, and so on. So I think you are happy guy raising their hand. So yes, we do. Um, we have a Eunice Fima who is raising their hand, and okay. I would love to invite them actually into okay into. I love, I love to promote them into the panelist section so that they can they can speak directly with you. So uh, okay. Eunice, I will be I'll be um, inviting you in as a panelist. You will see an invite. Please feel free to join. Okay, so why we wait for that? So Ahmed, that's what I think we can do because if you don't have regulatory powers and you don't have coercive powers, then you need, all that's left for you is talk. And so you have to frame the messages the way they will hit home to the people. Uh, welcome, Yunus. Thank you for joining us. You have a question or you'd like to share something with, the, with the, our speaker today? Yes. Go ahead, please. Okay. Um, the most common problem we have now, right now in the food uh, chain is food can be contaminated at any point of production. So what are the ways in preventing such? Um, 
contaminated to a certain point in production, in processing, and so on. But what we are focusing on is that as a matter of fact, use of chemicals to enhance either the aesthetics of food, the yield pattern, and lightening of the of the common banana or so on and preserving meat. Yes, food can be contaminated anytime. If you if you boil it and you put it back in the freezer, it may develop salmonella. If you you eat it the next day, you suffer from uh, endless running stomach because of salmonella and so on. But what we are talking about is the process that produces, that sends the, the produce to the market where it is now bought by you to translate it into food. It's not the food that's already been prepared by a hawker and is selling. They may have their own practices, but that's not what we are after. It's what produce, made that produce possible to go to the market to be purchased by the end user. That's what we are talking about. Because if we are going to talk about food poisoning due to poor handling, the hygiene, then you have to be talking about uh, hygiene certificate for the food handler, the lady who is selling rice and, and uh, whatever on the street. You have to ask whether they have the undergone food hygiene test and they have a current certificate which will last three months and so on and so forth. But that's a different barrier entirely. What we are talking is what brought it to the point where she bought it, bought the produce to translate it into cooked food before you came to buy it. Now you are worried about if the food was prepared hygienically, if I understand. Okay. All right, sir. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Eunice, for your for your question. All right. We also have um, you know a couple of folks here that have joined us today that are part of the the PIF uh, member uh, founding members, um, Dr. James and also Aziz. Um, I don't know if any of you are interested in perhaps also making a comment. Um, would love to hear from you um, if, uh, if you are able to speak. And while we're as waiting it, for- As it we're... should. <laughs> yes. We were supposed to be doing this together and you escaped, don't mind him. <laughs> <laughs> now, I have a question while we're waiting for folks here. Yeah. Uh, maybe, um, you know, it's really interesting that uh, we have um, situations, especially in Nigeria, where we don't do, we see a large number of deaths um, or on, on, I guess, uh, for lack of a better term, uh, engineer, for unprepared, people suddenly drop dead and, and uh, there's no, nobody knows why. And we don't really focus on doing autopsies to really understand better why people are, are dying due to uh, organ failure or some of these things. So nobody really knows the cause of this, you know? Um, could this be one of the reasons why we see people over a period of time, maybe they, their organs failing because of consistent and, and consumption of these contaminated and uh, product food staples over a long period of time? And, and what can be done? Uh, by some of our medical practitioners to maybe even help promote um, some of these uh, challenges that we're facing? Uh, well, the first part of the question, it may well be that uh, these uh, drugs and chemicals are implicated in this studying that. And uh, when it comes to autopsy, you know, most of our cultures, it's, uh, it's regarded in places as sacrilege to open up a dead person to see what killed them. But long before they actually drop dead, you see them suffering. Uh, like a guy continues to uh, cough or double over and cough blood, 
And they tell you, oh, that's how it is. It's been like that for 10 years. This would have been the time medical intervention would have been most helpful by way of medical appraisal, test examination to see whether what is causing this fellows or individuals uh, uh, poor condition. And uh, again, culturally, our people don't believe uh, death, which is a short term, can be halted in their journey towards coming to kill you by uh, medical people. No, when I say our people, not everybody believes you can do something about it. Mm. But I know the attitude is changing. But uh, generally, if you go home to your village and you sit with your grand uncles and them and you notice something and you say, no, tomorrow let's go to the hospital. He's saying, oh, no, no, my son, why do you want to bother me? There's no need, nothing you can do for me. This is, I'm old enough to suffer this. You know, that kind of thing. You have to be really stranded, strident in uh, your advice for them to consider getting up. Or um, like me, from recent experience, I go to call my, call the doctor, say, please, my uncle won't leave his house. Come with me, please, if you can, to see. On examination, they, they pick up a few things and after some period of treatment, the same guy will call you say, ah, my son, God will bless you. I feel much stronger now, you know? It's persuasion, we have to talk. And medical services, I doubt if they have the resources to go from doctor to uh, begin to appraise people's ailment. So what we need to advise people is to the first sign of any ailment, go and check it out in the next general hospital, the nearest. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, the, you know, sometimes culture, our culture is very rich and good. But there are aspects that are very invasive. They, and uh, it's something that we need to keep talking about. I don't think it has a single on-plate solution. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, it's certainly a very, a very important and tricky situation. And we hope that people are really paying attention to these things because these are serious issues and can lead to uh, really serious health um, health conditions. I've also yeah. invited uh, a couple of folks to uh, join us as panelists. I see Monshud uh, uh, Dolapo has, has joined us here. Thank you for joining us, sir. Would you like to join in the conversation, please? Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Ahmed. Uh, the first thing I want to thank the uh, speaker, my august, <laughs> all my august in, in the house. <laughs> I won't show my face. I know a guy already wants to show my face. <laughs> oh, go ahead. Don't worry. I know your face already. So, don't worry. <laughs> so thank you so much. Uh, and uh, yeah, actually, as expected, the presentation uh, is of uh, top class. Thank you so much. We continue to learn from you. And uh, I have to recognize that uh, we learned a lot from you and our other elders and leaders on the, in the house, like Kalagi, Bokar, and Co. So my little contribution is that, yeah, you remember when the speaker was delivering his paper, uh, he said, yeah, government supposed to play a critical part, critical role, and he used the word that yeah, I'm afraid to see government. Uh, in our own individual capacity, there's little to which we can do. That doesn't mean we can't do anything, uh, but you don't have that regulatory power. You don't have that thing. And I know people who are experts who know more than me. If we dig deeper, there will be some laws against food poisoning there may be some laws somewhere. I don't think we are short of laws or we are short of things. Is that way to do the right thing? If people don't take personal accountability for their 
health and safety, what can PIF do? So at our own uh, uh, small level, right, at our micro level, maybe we can do and sensitize the way uh, Ogari has said. So thank you so much. I really enjoyed the session and I want to stop here. Uh, we'll thank you. Benefit from your wisdom. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. Yeah, as is, you know, it's uh, what can you say? It, it, really, we exist, government exists for the people. So it's usual to say, okay, government should take the lead, and they are expected to take the lead. After all, you pay taxes to government, you pay levies to government, you do all sorts of things to government. But it, so it makes sense for you to expect things in return. And when we say government, people always, very nearly always, look up to federal government. No, I say for me, the local government who comes banging on your door, say uh, tenement rate. I had a good laugh with some people the other day. They came from local government council. They said they, they are collecting tenement rates for the year. So I asked them, good, how much is it? 40,000, okay. So what am I getting for it? Oh, it's tenement rate, that's the law. You see, the, we say we have local government. It's a broad issue. Nobody, I don't think they've been sat down to say, look, these are your responsibilities. You come and get the waste from the houses, you dispose of them, make sure there are the, the roads, are drivable in your locality, not potholes everywhere. Make sure the drains are clear and so on. And uh, the lighting, street lightings are working. These things all roll into one. So a guy contests an election and he becomes local government chairman, whether he was selected or elected, is there. He, all he knows is, oh, federal government allocation comes monthly and he takes it and he, uh, off he goes. You don't see him till the next time. There is no duties attached to the boot. And uh, at the end of the day, they, they don't know what to do for you. They don't know what their duties are. They, if you go into the offices talking about food poisoning of the public health uh, department in your local government, the nearest one to you, we call them public health centers. That's where we go to. We go to, and this COVID nineteen injection. They are. I'm glad they organized them effectively to give that out. So you go in there to talk about food poisoning. The ladies you meet there because most of the times ladies are more sympathetic and empathetic. So they walk these areas. When you go, you talk to them, they put their head on the table, say, sorry, Olga, there's nothing we can do. We have no resources. Then you say, have you reported this to your local government chairman? They say, yeah. say yes, a million times. So okay. we people need to take up the responsibility. And it's also our responsibility to challenge the system, not to just look at it and say, mm, what can you do? Yeah, you can do a lot. You can book an appointment with the chairman and go and sit in front of him and tell him what you think he's doing or should be doing. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to matters like this, even the awareness we are having in mind as a suggestion for people to, it has to originate from the local government and domiciled in the local mm -hmm. government. Mm -hmm. Because if NTA puts out uh, a jingle on... Uh, food uh, contamination, uh, processing, and so on. It will not come to fall until it gets to the local government where the, where the uh, farmers live and the vendors. I mean, all the markets we go to are domiciled in your locality. You don't, it has to be really difficult before I get, get on the train from Wari to Kano to go and buy something. What am I going to buy? Nothing. Everything I consume is here. Engineer, oh. we have a question from uh, someone yeah. in the audience. I know it's a question okay. that you, I think you might have alluded to, to the answer to this, but somebody did put out a question. Uh, Sally Huba said, now that we have had cases of our farm products being rejected outside the shores of Nigeria, 
does that imply that our regulatory agencies don't have the means to check these adulterations before leaving the shores of Nigeria? So I think uh, it, it goes back to the question of the export uh, promotion agency. The question is, I think for this particular, for Salio is, are we um, negligent of doing it or do we just don't have the means to do it? Well, a bit of both. It's, uh, it's the, a part of different tools that we should use to get out an end product. The, listen, the, the export promotion people, if they are the ones directly in charge of ensuring that only standard items, food produce, process and semi-process are allowed to be exported and are available for EU inspection team, then you have to think whether they are funded or they have the resources to do this job. They have very qualified people across Nigeria. Anywhere you go, there are qualified people, extremely qualified. But the resources, the way we talk to do the job, and again, there's this factor, it's government job. Once you get in there, you just show up your face, show your face in the office. And there's no definite program that's been carved out, say, this is what you do. It's not the same as if you work for some uh, uh, international company where the first year they say, this is what you do. Second year, this is what you do. And Third year, before you become a supervisor, you would have gone through the crucible to get this, to know how things are done. So these people, it's a bit of both, bit of everything. They, are, they can do the job. They may not be directly on the job, but then they may be unwilling because there are no tools to turn out a good job. There's no fund, no resources, and uh, there's no guidance, no nurturing, nothing. So they just put you in there and say, okay, you are export promotion supervisor. Then you go to the docks in Tinkan Island or Wari Port or Lagos or Calabar or wherever. Then you fall in with the rest of the multi crew in the ports. And in no time, they snare you into this bribery and corruption thing. Mm. Give me something, get something. Mm. So I think it's, a, it's not a question that can be unbundled by a single answer. Mm. Well, thank you. And thank you, Sally, for, for asking that, that, uh, that really great uh, question. Um, you know, within the past uh, 45 minutes or so, engineer, you have given us a number of suggestions. Um, and thank you, Chairman, for actually posing and making this statement. You have given us a number of suggestions on how to promote the best ways and the best ways to stop adding wrong and harmful ingredients uh, to our produce. Um, and to stop some of these bad practices and uh, that, that can improve the, the external market penetration of our agricultural goods, both local and also overseas. Um, I was wondering if any, perhaps maybe some of our attendees today, uh, in addition to some of the recommendations and suggestions that you've made, uh, if they have any other ideas or suggestions based on their knowledge and, and sort of background on some of the things that can be done in order to address uh, to address this issue. So please feel free if you have any uh, specific thoughts um, around ways that we can make this better that uh, that hasn't been either approached yet or maybe we uh, the agencies involved can do better. Uh, well, what? Yeah, go on. Sorry. No, no. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, while I was going to say why we are waiting for people to jump in, the, uh, the political angle of it, we also need to consider it because if our legislators at the local government level and state level are really keen on getting some things done, I'm sure we get on to a better foot. But you find the same uh, kind of lethargy when you go to speak with them. Mm -hmm. Oh, they, they, they give you a feedback that will make you scratch your head and say, what the hell am I doing with these guys? So we need to, that's where the awareness issue come from. The awareness we are talking about, we should be mm -hmm. able to sit across from legislators and challenge them face-to-face -face as people say, look, 
this is our community here, and they came to, to discuss this issue with you. What plan do you have? Mm -hmm. Because we have this suggestion, that suggestion, that suggestion. Those are the kind of things that I believe can help. Because mm -hmm. when you look at the issues, if it's not flagged at the right level, no backing, no matter how you talk to the market woman, they are not going to listen. Mm -hmm. But these are the same people who send uh, their agents out to the market to seize the basket of, communicate, of contaminated food and mm -hmm. find the people for displaying them in the wrong place, mm -hmm. not the contents of what they are displaying or the, mm -hmm. the, the health worthiness of it. Mm -hmm. So the, if we ever do any engagement, it should be with the three layers of government, the executive, mm -hmm. the uh, legislature, and mm -hmm. the judiciary. If you, if you talk to, if you engage that on general of your state, it should have an idea what laws are still alive for covering these kind of issues. Mm -hmm. If it doesn't, then we could remind him mm -hmm. because he's one of us. He's yes. supposed to be working for us. So that's what I think. Uh, well, thank, you. Things, yeah. thank you so much. I mean, this has really been such an amazing, it's always um, impactful and always full of um, really great information uh, that people can take away and also uh, continue to explore and think deeply about. This has always been a topic uh, or an issue that has been just one of the many issues that we struggle with uh, when it comes to um, uh, our agricultural sector, um, our food safety and hygiene issues, and promoting safety um, around this thing from an overall perspective. So we really appreciate you uh, taking the time today. And we also certainly appreciate many of our attendees that continue to join this PEEF virtual talks. Um, I have uh, Dr. Musa, uh, who is our executive secretary, and I would love to invite him uh, at this point to also uh, say a few words um, and, and take us to the next stage um, of our session today. Doctor, are you with us? Yes, yes, I am. Can you see me? Yes, we can. Yes, I can see you. Oh, yeah. right. You are branded. Thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> Thank you, know, yes. Thank you also, Ahmed. I think we have uh, Dolapo on the on the panel. Let's hear him speak. Um, so I would like him to speak. We also have Dr. Shaibu uh, Musa. Uh, if, oh yeah. Uh, yeah. Shaibu Musa is a, a former MD of uh, the medical services at NMPC. Please yeah. with us. And also thanks to our major general retired uh, Sally Uba calling him from the UK. So uh, Alaji Dolapo, can you please, uh, you're also an expert, social media expert in this area. You're already on the panel. Uh, okay, can you just make a few remarks? Yes. Good afternoon, our esteemed uh, members of BIV. It's my great honor to be part of this uh, occasion. Uh, I thank my, my elder in the business, Engineer Oyofu, for the <laughs> wonderful you submission. Again. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> for the wonderful submission, even though I miss a lot of it because of uh, the uh, inefficiency of uh, the network around here. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes, but nevertheless, I trust that um, the submissions have been very, very useful and very uh, enlightening. Um, at the risk of repeating some of the things that have been said, the big issue really is uh, awareness. Awareness on the part of almost every one of us. Uh, first, awareness of the part of the, of the producer himself who seeks to enhance his product by putting uh, some of these offensive ingredients 
materials to enhance to enhance them or to make them ripen faster or to make them uh, last longer on the shelf. Many of them do not know the consequence of their actions. They don't know what the what impact this these drugs, like we call them, these drugs, these chemicals, these enhancers, uh, make to the products they are trying to enhance. Now, the consumers themselves, many of us don't know. You want to buy bananas, you go there, you see the ones that ripe naturally, the tendency is those ones that thrive naturally, they don't look as inviting, they don't look as clean, they don't look as neat as the ones that are forced to ripe. So people are more attracted to these ones that are forced to ripe without bothering to check, without bothering to think how. How is it that this thing will just get yellow like that? Like uh, my uh, senior elder would say, senior uh, <laughs> elder would say, it just come yellow. You know, okay. so we, 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 and but then you open them and you take it for the first bite. Sometimes you, you, you can feel the taste, you can, you can feel the smell of those uh, agents there. So, so that's the second one. The third one is on the part of the, the, uh, the regulators. Well, there's no belaboring the point that there is a lot of letters. People sit back, they don't do what they're supposed to do. Yeah, so the big thing for us to, nip, to, to, to reduce this is to keep shouting, keep talking about it, keep, well, never mind those of us who are in this business, let us widen our network. Let us keep talking to the people. Let us keep talking to the consumers, the farmers, all of them. So it goes even far back as to the plantations with control. See, so these are the these, these are the issues. This is the one thing that will help us a lot. That's one. Then the second aspect of the enhancement that we, I mean the enlightenment that we can do is to target the young ones, the schools, the schools, even the primary schools. You can think you may think those children are so so small, but those children we go back home and say, ah, Papa, let's make them know they put this kind of chemical for our food, though. Oh, yes. uh, uh, Baba, they say we should not put this, uh, 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 what do they call that one? That is, uh, I, I'm trying to remember the common, the, uh, the that, uh, sniper, sniper. white bag. They say don't, yes, sniper. <laughs> uh, otapia, yeah. uh, otapia, they say don't put otapia in the beans. You, you see, so those children, they will refuse to eat because their teachers have told them that this thing can harm you. So that's a very, very important and very useful way of getting to this to the people who do these things. Uh, so uh, let me not uh, take the whole stage. I will stop it at this point, and so people, other people can contribute. Thank you for the opportunity. I'm so grateful. Thank you, man. Long time no okay. hear from you. Yeah, thank you so uh, much. Uh, I'm, try, I'm uh, trying to put my face on the screen so that you can. But the network, <laughs> I'm just trying to align you. You haven't paid, that's okay. why. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much, uh, Elijah Monshu uh, Thank you very much, sir. Thank you so much. Uh, we have benefited from your also experience and knowledge in this area. Um, we also yeah. have um, Dr. Jim Komolafe, who is an expert on uh, behavioral I know studies, and uh, those of us who are familiar with the PIF knowledge sharing platform, uh, he used to share his uh, knowledge with us. Uh, I don't know if you can make one or two points regarding, is there a behavioral uh, you know, perspective to the issue here? Um, if he's willing to share his thoughts, please go ahead. We're giving you the opportunity. Uh, can we also have uh, Abdulaziz Elema? You have a legal background. Do you see any legal issue mm -hmm. with uh, applying sanctions uh, on this subject matter? Uh, he sent in a question which was very, very important 
in view of these uh, African trades, uh, what was the implication if we have to send product across African borders, not to talk of to Europe or to, to the Americas? Uh, would you have to say something uh, or that is it? Um, General Saliuba? Uh, yes, okay. okay, please go ahead. Yes. Um, uh... Good afternoon, good evening, good morning, depending on where you are. Uh, it is a very interesting program, which I just captured last night. And I decided to uh, be on listening in. I think this, we, we need to take it to the next level by really inviting the people, the regulatory authorities in the next round of talk. Let them tell us their experience. Let them share with us what the people feel. Because this is a very detrimental issue, detrimental to our health, invariably detrimental to the health of the nation. So I, I, I want to suggest that in subsequent uh, programs, we can really invite the regulatory authorities. I am looking at particularly the uh, office of the NAFDAC, and then maybe Standard uh, Organization of Nigeria and several others that are regulatory authorities to this. We need much, much, much and more platforms to air out this for people to know what is going on around us. This is so educative because a lot of people have now switched from eating meat to fish, but not knowing that even the fish has its own problems, you, you, you know? So in a nutshell, I thank all the organizers, the presenters, everybody, and I will wish you best of the season and uh, you'll be seeing us from time to time chipping in, in the little contribution we can. Have a beautiful day. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Uh, Thank you so much. Um, I think so. The objective has been uh, achieved. We invited participation and we wanted to have heard. Uh, so we have done that. Um, so Engineer Oyofu, can, yes. we, can we wrap up now? It was that we, we can bring the program to uh, a close. Well, yeah, we could, uh, but uh, let, me yeah. add, let me add something which I've been thinking about. You know, Please, what's been going on in the news now, the, every government at any level says, oh, agriculture is the thing. But the component they do not ever mention is storage, preservation, production, handling and processing of what we eat. Uh, so I think if we are going to engage people, my first point of call would be Ministry of Agriculture because they are very vocal in telling everybody, oh, agriculture is the new thing. It's not just produce. You have to guide people on how to produce safely and how to process safely and so on. So otherwise, at the end of the, the day, we defeat ourselves at the goalposts because when our produce are not ac acceptable elsewhere, what are we going to do already? Because of these malpractices, farmers lose up to 30% of their produce to early decay because when you pump them up with uh, chemicals, they decay very quickly and it's no use. So I would think we should think, place Ministry of Agri at the center point of what we plan to do. And the Bank of Industries, whatever that means, that gives money to people to go into farming. So your service is lost? No, I'm with you. So, uh, Engineer Oyofu, are those your closing remarks? Yeah. Um, okay. Okay. Excellent. Excellent. Okay. Um, so we really, really uh, appreciate your um, session today because 
like the chairman of the PUT, PEF has said, uh, we have run a number of uh, P virtual talks uh, structured around uh, basic uh, uh, issues that affect our ordinary lives. Uh, the first one was on the TVET, Technical Vocational Education Training. Uh, we ran two sessions uh, because we see the African continent as uh, an institution that will transform it if it utilizes the abundant human capital. And that human capital needs to be enhanced. Uh, tertiary education is necessary, but with the population that we have, we also need to empower people at the TVET level. They need to have hands-on skills that they can use to uh, you know, um, help themselves, feed themselves, and contribute to the nation building across uh, the continent. Now, we, we then follow that up with the agri uh, sector, uh, PVT, focusing on agribusiness and how we can create uh, agripreneurs. Uh, we, we also had an expert uh, based in the US uh, who led that session. Um, and we had a second repeat of the event, again, to take it to the stakeholders uh, in the public sector as well as private sector. So this session we're having today is, uh, is, is a very, very, very important one. It affects the health of our people. And like uh, General Saliwa said, um, you know, you cannot move away from beef and go to fish where they use Gamalian 20 to harvest fish, right? And you know, Oyofu, you said that. You, you spread yes, the, I did. the chemical I did. and then the, the fish will be half dead. Uh, yes. And then it can be picked up, but then whoever consumes is endangering their own health. So nobody is free from the risk of uh, eating contaminated food. So we have really, you know, um, benefited from your session. Uh, as PIF, what we we'll do is uh, to strategically take this forward with regulators, but also to articulate an awareness campaign. Uh, advocacy, you know, campaign, uh, the same strategy we're trying to put in place for TVET. So this is another one. And for those who may not know, Engineer Yofo, when we started PIF uh, four or five years ago, uh, you also contributed uh, a medical algorithm with our medical expert for the NYC orientation camp. I don't yes, know if I did. you remember that. I did. So, yes, so, I remember. So, so, so that is it. So this is another one. This campaign that we're going to plan now with Jingus, uh, as you have indicated in your presentation, we want to give effect to it. We want to take it from talking to doing. Uh, and uh, we leverage uh, our network and make sure that we begin to make impact bit by bit. Uh, like, uh, as he said, uh, yes, uh, everybody has to contribute. The government cannot be the only one. But we are also part of the government because either we vote for them or we don't, they claim to represent us. Probably. <laughs> yes. So, so, so thank you so much. Uh, part of what I do at the end of this uh, P, P, P virtual talk is to express appreciation uh, and then talk about the next steps. Uh, so I would like, as usual, to thank uh, our almighty creator who has given us the ability to organize this. But uh, also, you know, Engineer Yofu, uh, I recall it's about uh, a few weeks back that I engaged you about this session and uh, I knew that you would not turn the offer down, uh, you accepted. And here we are today, it's been done. So uh, we're very grateful for this, but should I really be thanking you because you are part of PIF? You are just contributing <laughs> your <focus. laughs> Well, thank you, you, you thank your father for, for doing things for you. So thank you, you can thank, thank, thank your brother. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, we really appreciate you. Uh, we know you are one of those that if we invite, we're not shy away. So we really appreciate you. Uh, we also want to appreciate uh, our BOT chairman. He's, uh, he's our father because, uh, you know, he's just there for us anytime we, we do this. He's, he's out. He, he does what you should do. Uh, so really appreciate you, sir, Alaji and Jenny Abdullah Bukar for giving us the opening remarks at this session. Thank uh, you very much. Thank you very much, doctor. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. 
uh, uh, you observe that uh, Ahmed Suleiman uh, has uh, remained quiet. This is because he, <laughs> he's drunk he, his coffee. No one. <laughs> yes, uh, he's, he's got, gotten another appointment. Uh, he's okay. based in Boston, so he has. Uh, he has uh, taken off, but we really appreciate okay. uh, his role in making this a success. We have had a uh, meeting before today, and he has been very, very instrumental uh, to the success of uh, this uh, P virtual talk. Uh, thanks to him. And of course, our team that remains silent, uh, the, the IT team, the admin team, uh, that, uh, okay, I should mention them, Adiza, Fatima, Jamila, they are there remain quiet, but they enable us to be able to virtually deliver uh, this uh, session each time we organize uh, the session. Uh, the session has also been uh, streamed uh, yeah, on YouTube. So we're going to share the link so that uh, anytime you can go and, and watch it. Uh, for those who missed it, they can also watch it. Um, and of course, our participants, uh, we are very grateful. When we uh, advertised it, we had registrants from, uh, from Nigeria, uh, a lot, uh, from Cameroon, uh, from Egypt, from Saudi Arabia, from UK, uh, from Canada. So indeed, this has been an international event and uh, we hope uh, our efforts uh, will uh, resonate uh, with a similar location with the kind of challenges we're having in Nigeria and in Africa. So thank you very much, in particular those who have been able to contribute uh, during the interactive session. Thank you so much. Uh, so what is next after this uh, PVT uh, on the food uh, vendor, the quality of uh, food production? The next thing for us uh, is our biggest event in the year. Uh, usually in November, we have the a PIF annual conference. Uh, we have had this now consistently for four years. So this is the fifth year. Uh, we will be engaging with the, the board of trustees and the executive management uh, you know, committee of a PEF uh, to, before we begin to communicate. Uh, but uh, the, the date will be November 26th. Uh, there will be further communication on this. Uh, we have lined up uh, you know, speakers, uh, that will really make the conference uh, uh, quite, uh, you know, exciting. Uh, so you'll be hearing from us uh, through our normal channel on the PIF um, knowledge sharing platform, the registered uh, members platform, and uh, through the social media. Uh, of course, you can also go to the website, uh, pif.ng. Uh, uh, we also post uh, information there. Uh, so on this note, I would like to thank you uh, once again, um, wishing uh, us uh, a, a very uh, nice uh, evening or nice day, uh, depending on where you are in the globe. Thank you so much. And uh, we would like to sign off. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank Lovely. You. Harriman, all the best. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Araji. And uh, thank you, technical thank you. team, for all your work. Thank you, Dolafo. And uh, thank, you. thank you.